Hey guys, welcome back to Control System Laboratories. Now, have you ever wanted to design a simple control system for a project that you're working on, but you didn't know where to start since you didn't have a mathematical model for the system? Well, in this video, I want to show you some simple system identification techniques that you can use to develop a simple model for your system without having to derive the equations of motion mathematically. And I'm going to use my Zumo robot here as the demonstrator. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I'm really excited about this topic. And it's not just because it seems boring to most people. I think it's incredible that we can take a system that we know very little about and then be able to build up a mathematical model of it just by running a few simple tests. Now, in order to explain what I mean, let's go to the blackboard and describe the process for generating the model that I'm going to create for this car. Now, I want to use this model to determine the closed loop stability of my system. And ultimately, I want to use it to develop a linear controller if the unaugmented system doesn't meet my requirements. This is just a general block diagram of my system so far. Now, you'll notice that I don't have a controller, so I'm not trying to model that. Really, all I'm interested in is the open loop transfer function from the input to the output. But the question is, for this system, what is my input and what is my output? Let's see if we can break it down a little bit more simply. My actuators are the motors that drive the treads, but the motors move by varying amount of voltage to them. And I vary the voltage by commanding a number in software to the motor controller board that sets a pulse width modulation value, or PWM. PWM is a way to vary the intensity of an output that only has two states, on and off. For example, the light in my room can only be on at 100%, or off completely at 0%. But if I was to flick the light switch on and off fast enough, it will appear to be dimmer to me based on the relative on time versus off time. And this is what the motor controller is doing with the voltage. It's rapidly flickering between on and off to give the result of an intermediate power level. So really, I'm commanding my vehicle by setting a pulse width modulated number somewhere between 0 and 400 counts for this particular motor controller board. Now, my block diagram in the upper left corner isn't exactly right because I'm not really going to command a PWM. I'm going to command a degrees per second and then convert that into a pulse width modulated value in software. But for the sake of this video on how we develop a model, this is going to work just fine. Well, so now where do we go from here with our model? Well, the motors produce a torque which gets imparted on the wheels, which then in turn drives the tread of our car. And if we drive the left tread forward at the pulse width modulated counts and the right tread backwards, then the car is just going to rotate or spin in place. And the output is going to be a true angular velocity of our car. But I have a rate gyro on board, so the output of my system is going to be the sensed angular rate from my gyro as the car is spinning, and not the true angular rate, which we can't know exactly. Now the output from the gyro is counts, but I'm going to convert that to degrees per second in software. Now I just mentioned it, but something that might not be instantly obvious is that I can't know the true angular velocity of my car. I can only ever know the sensed angular velocity. And if my sensor is really good and fast and accurate, then those two values are going to be pretty much the same. But we already know from my video on modeling our MIMS gyro that I've set this sensor up to have an internal low-pass filter with a 12.5 Hz cutoff frequency. So we already know that the sensed value is going to be different from the real value, especially at higher frequencies. But that's okay, because the sensed value is all I really care about when determining stability of this closed-loop system because it's the value that the controller is going to close the loop with. So this chain of all these different physical processes from the input to the output seems kind of complicated. And if you wanted to model them all individually, it could be difficult to get it accurate. But luckily, we don't need to model all of the bits and pieces individually, because one transfer function can take care of all of it. And once we have this complete transfer function, we can apply all of our linear control system design techniques that we're covering in the lecture videos to design a controller for this system. So now the question is, how can we bypass knowing all of the different internal components of our car and generate a transfer function? Well, we do that through test, by placing an input into the system, measuring the output, and then comparing them and calculating a transfer function from that. You might recall from my video on transfer functions that a transfer function is defined as the Laplace transform of the impulse response of a system. 
So with that in mind, maybe we should just apply an impulse to the PWM, or basically set it to a very high number for a single frame, and then take the Laplace transform of the resulting angular velocity profile to get the transfer function. Or basically what we're looking for is the location of the poles and zeros of our system. However, the problem with this method is that you have to take the Laplace transform of a signal and not an equation, which means you need to do it numerically. Maybe there's a way to do a numerical Laplace transform, but I'm just not aware of it. The problem I see with it is that the locations of poles and zeros are the only important spots in an S-plane. And finding the poles numerically could be tricky. That's because they're the locations in the S-plane where the summation in the Laplace transform barely equals infinity. And other places in the S-plane can sum to infinity. So if you're numerically trying to take the Laplace transform, how can you tell the difference between barely infinite and completely infinite, especially with a finite set of operations? I don't know, but if you guys know, please leave a comment below and point me to the direction where I can find out, because I'd like to know. But that doesn't mean that this method we're using is useless. If the system behaves really similar to a second order equation, then you can manually determine the locations of poles and zeros through inspection of the impulse response. This is where those ubiquitous damping curve charts come into play. You can just find the curve that looks like your response, and then you've got your transfer function. So in this case, the impulse response that I drew kind of resembles the black line in this damping curve chart, which has a damping ratio of 1.4. And along with the time it takes for this impulse to decay, we could get our natural frequency of the system. We would have everything we need in order to generate a second order equation. So let's measure the impulse response for our car and see what we get. I've loaded some software onto the car that will command 200 PWM counts for one frame. <laughs> that was it. Uh, did you miss it? I'll play it one more time from a different angle because it's kind of quick. I think it's amazing that all of that information from the input to the output was captured in that one little blip. So let's take a look at what the sensor saw and see what we can make of it. And here's the plot. Now I've manually drawn in red the impulse, which was 200 counts for one frame. And if we compare the resulting degrees per second against our chart on the left, I'd say it's probably closest to that red line with a damping ratio of 0.6. And that's because of the negative amplitude that occurs after the impulse is over. So now I'm wondering, well, does this make sense? I would have expected a damping ratio closer to one since the car is a rigid body for the most part, and I wouldn't expect any oscillations to occur because of this impulse. I think maybe what could have happened is that the torque from the motor stretched the rubber treads a little bit and they acted a bit like a spring. And once the torque went away, the springs recoiled a bit and gave us that little bit of negative velocity at the end. Again, that's just my guess at the moment. I don't really know but I'm gonna move on to a different method and see if we can get a similar result. And that is by looking at the frequency response of the system, or using Fourier analysis rather than Laplace analysis. By using Fourier, we can generate a Bode plot for our system, or basically we can find out how each unique frequency across the spectrum is manipulated as it passes through our system. How much does the amplitude of the signal change, and how much does the signal get shifted in time? From the Bode plot, we can assess closed loop stability directly, which is what I wanted in the first place, or we can back out the transfer function by understanding how poles and zeros affect the shape of the Bode plot, essentially sketching a Bode plot by hand, but in reverse. So we need to find a way to input every single frequency across the spectrum into our system and measure the output. Now the obvious choice to excite every frequency is just to input every frequency as a pure sine wave into the system. And you can do this using a sine wave that is continuously increasing or decreasing in frequency. This is called a sine sweep. And once you measure the output, you can generate the Bode plot by taking the Fourier transform of that. Or another type of sine sweep, and this one's a little bit easier to see, is to input each frequency in discrete steps and pausing between each one. For example, input a pure one hertz sine wave, measure the output, and graph it on your Bode plot. Then move on to a next higher frequency. And in this way, you can build up the Bode plot for each of the frequencies you're interested in. However, I don't wanna do this for my car either. And don't get me wrong, this is a fantastic method and it's used all the time. 
I just want to use a method that's a little bit simpler and less time consuming for an at home project. Another way of inputting all frequencies at once is with an impulse function like we did earlier. You can see that this is true by taking the Laplace transform of the impulse function, which is just one, then set s equal j omega, but there are no s's, so it's still just one. Well, technically it's one plus zero imaginary. And then finding the gain and phase shift from this. Well, the gain is one across all frequencies, and the phase shift is zero across all frequencies. So it's identical to our sine sweep, except all of the frequencies are condensed into one massive impulse right at the beginning. But we've already analyzed the impulse response for our system and saw that it might not be right. So finally, yet another way to input all of the frequencies is with a step input. A step input passes the low frequency inputs, but attenuates the high frequency ones since there's this integrator when going from an impulse to a step. So sometimes you can get a better response from a slow lumbering system like my car from a step response. So let me give you an overview of what I'm about to do. I'm going to command a step input, which means go from zero PWM counts to some non-zero number in one frame. I'm going to record the sensed angular velocity in degrees per second, which will be close to a step in shape, but not exact because of the lag in the system. And it'll probably go to a different height since the input is in counts and the output is degrees per second. I can then approximate a second order transfer function from this data, that is if it matches closely enough from one of the second order damping curves for a step input. So essentially we're doing the same thing that we did for an impulse input, but with a step input and see if we get a better result. And that was it. Pretty much just as simple as the impulse command. Now I'll pull the data into MATLAB and then we'll plot it up and see what the step response looks like. And there's the plot. And you can see that it produced a fairly nice rise at the beginning of the step input, but then when it held that constant voltage at the end there, there's this oscillation or it, it looks like it had trouble holding a constant velocity. And again, I don't know what's causing this at the moment, but if I replay the video from the actual test, you can listen to it and actually hear it struggling to maintain a constant angular velocity. Until I get that figured out, I'm going to focus just on the rise portion of the step response, since it looks pretty good. And we'll compare it against the damping curves for a step input. So let's take a look at the step response. The start of the step starts at about 0.59 seconds, and then it's pretty much fully risen by about 0.75 seconds. Also something that I find kind of interesting is that we put in a step of 100 counts, but we've got an output of about 110 degrees per second, so it's almost one to one. So when we look at our chart, I would say that this falls somewhere between a damping ratio of one and two. And our step response has a rise time of about 0.16 seconds. So if we look at our chart and somewhere in between damping ratio of one and two, it's fully risen maybe around 2.5 pi. So we can calculate the natural frequency for our system by taking 2.5 pi and dividing it by 0.16 seconds, which is about 49 radians per second. And so with that and a damping ratio of maybe around 1.4, we can now write the transfer function for our system as a second order equation. Of course, we also have to add a gain to this of 1.1 to account for going from counts to degrees per second. And so there you have it, a second order transfer function that can approximate our system from PWM inputs into degrees per second output. Now, I just want to stress that there are a lot of different ways to generate a model for our system, and most of them are probably more accurate than this method. But this is a good starting point for a model that we can expand on in future videos. All right, so there it is. A simple method for producing a second order transfer function that can approximately describe your system. Of course, you might be asking yourself, well, what if my system doesn't act like a second order transfer function? Then what do I do? Well, I'm going to answer that question and a lot more on modeling in future videos. So don't forget to subscribe so you don't miss any of them. Also, if you have any questions or comments on this video, please leave them below and I'll try to get to them if I can. And always, thanks for watching. Hey Zuma, what did you think of the video? Did you like it? 
Ah, what do you know? Oh yeah, one last thing. The t-shirts that I wore in this video were sent to me by some of my subscribers, and I really appreciate it, including this one here that doubles as a guitar. But I definitely don't expect you guys to send me stuff, uh, but if you'd like to, I'd put my address on the About page uh, from the YouTube channel homepage, so you guys can find it there. If you send me any t-shirts or little gadgets or anything like that, I'll definitely show them off in my future videos. Alright, I'll see you next week.